Good morning, everyone. My name is Barbara, and I would like to welcome you all to our latest Novage webinar episode. This week, enjoy a Thinking Particle 6.3, Powerful Cash and Particles Import on Alembic. In this webinar, Edwin Brown will create a dynamic sim in Max Thinking Particles and showcase Thinking Particle 6.3, Powerful New Cash Hierarchical read-write operation in file type .tpc. New features include data channel, cache recording dialog, cache writing channel, shape channel. Edwin will also touch on TP6.3, superb Alembic file import export feature, and we can't wait. Now, a little bit more about uh, today's presenter. Edwin Brown is the co-founder and CEO of Cebus Visual Technology and at the development, development team for Thinking Particles and the Render Software. Also, he manages the North American Cebus office. He has dealt with visual effects program code since 1988. And in his free time, he enjoys VR and console games, photography, coaches, baseball, and he gardens. Who knew? Okay, before we get going, here's an overview of what we do at Novage. Novage is one of the largest online stores for design software. We offer a huge assortment of software solutions that cater to virtually every designer's needs. So put us to the test and come visit our webpage at novage.com. Coming up next week, introducing Solid Thinking Evolve 2016. Here it is. Did I switch the page? Here it is. And last but not least, today's webinar is free and is being recorded. So if you want to rewatch this or any webinar episode in our collection, just head on over to Novage's YouTube and Vimeo channels. And now without further ado, I'm going to um, pass um, the baton to Edwin and make him the presenter. Um, you should be able to see his video shortly. Okay, take take it take it away. Yeah, one second. Uh, something didn't work uh, as it worked before. Okay, we do see your screen. Can you just we don't again? anymore. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Just give me the screen control mm -hmm. again. Okay. <coughs> Here we go. Okay, so that's it. Here we go. Great. Sorry for that. You should nope. see my screen now. We do. Okay, I'll, I'll start with my presentation now. Uh, first, welcome everyone to this presentation. Thank you for attending this webinar. My name is Edwin Braun of CBS Visual Technology, and I'm going to talk about uh, our latest release of Thinking Particles, which is 6.3. And in Thinking Public 6.3, we added several new uh, features, including a dedicated Alembic import and Alembic export. I will explain how it works in Thinking Particles and how we can get that over to Maya. This is why you see right now a 3D Studio Max and Maya on the other side. Um, so the Maya thing is a real Maya version, so that's not just a JPEG picture, it's a real Maya version. Um, I have to uh, say before I do this presentation, I'm not a Maya expert. I grew up with uh, 3D Studio Max and will always love 3D Studio Max and use 3D Studio Max. So, um, excuse me right from the beginning about if I do something strange in Maya, um, it is because I'm not a Maya user. However, it should be fine to just show you uh, what we did and I will explain how you can use our new Alembic export. But before we dive into the Alembic export, I would like to give you an overview of thinking particles. Because we have a mixed audience, so there might be a, a Maya users, for example, who don't know thinking particles or don't uh, have not seen how it works in uh, 3D Studio Max. So thinking particles is a particle effect system. It's a fully procedural particle effect system. And I'm creating here right now a thinking particle system. It comes with its own interface. And I'll just bring the interface in here. It's uh, as I said, a procedural effect system. It is very powerful, 
Many movie productions use thinking particles in their daily uh, workflow, and it's a hierarchical system. So everything you create here, you can give it names, and you should. So let's say I want to create something like uh, particles, and I have now uh, created a particle group that's called particles, and I create a subgroup in where I can have smoke and let's say whatever we want to have here, debris and so on. So you get the idea. It's a hierarchical system where we control and you have access to particles. That becomes very powerful at the later stage because you can access now and assign effects to these particle groups either to the particles here, to the tree root, or individually to each subgroup. So that's one of the powerful things in uh, thinking particle, that you are always under control, you have always full control how these groups work. Then we have these things called dynamic sets. And here we do the same thing. You can have hierarchies of dynamic sets, and I will talk how we can work with hierarchies and cash the hierarchies out. And you always should give the hierarchies uh, names that you recognize so that you don't get lost when your systems become more complex. So usually I start out with a create hierarchy, and then we might have something like uh, secondary, whatever you want. So you can name your hierarchies, and then I would usually group the forces in one uh, dynamic set, and then you, you would usually end up with a simulation dynamic set or whatever you want. So that keeps everything structured and again, it's fully precision so you can access all these areas in inside of thinking particles. So let me show you how to create a very simple setup. So I'm going to create a particle emitter. So that's what we call generators, so I would just Use a position born. It's very simple. I just click the position born in here. So now we have in our create dynamic set of position born. So if I were not to do anything else, we can now go to the frame slider and we see the particles emit here. Let me just zoom in here. So as you can see, we have some settings we can adjust right away. Uh, we can increase the speed, for example and you see instant results, so the speeds are changing here. Um, another thing we want to have is maybe we want to have some shapes. We just don't want the dots here, so we can assign shapes, and we can do that procedurally. And here's one simple, very simple step. Uh, we can assign static shapes or geometry. Uh, GM instance shapes. So for a Maya user, for example, it is impossible to create uh, this little object here that comes standard with every 3D Studio Max. Let me create this teapot. So if a Maya user wants the teapot in Maya, he can create it now here in 3D Studio Max and use our Alembic export to get the teapot inside of Maya. And how do we do that? How do we assign the teapot to these particles? For that, I'm going to select my uh, thinking particles, bring up the user interface again, and we're going to use the uh, shape and geom instancing. What we do here now, that's the first procedural step we are doing here in thinking particles, is we're connecting the created particles of each particle this position born operator creates is output here to this germ instance operator. And now we can just pick an object, one or many, it doesn't matter, I'll just pick one object, and now we will have teapots instead of these particle dots or points here. And we can now say, okay, I want the box normalized, and then we can control the size with our particle generator, we just say, okay, give me a size of five, and we have these teapots here. So if I wanted now uh, to have this animation in Maya, we can export that. What you've seen here is just a very small glimpse at how thinking particles works. It's a 
fully node-based procedural system. You have full access to every operator and you can feed inputs and outputs to every operator and you can change these inputs and outputs. You can have conditions, uh, all kinds of uh, scripted effects, expressions, so it's very powerful and flexible system we have here. <coughs> so let's go and export this. For that, I'm creating, just for the fun of it, another dynamic set that we call export. Because usually an export would happen at the end. If everything is fine and I want to export it, I would uh, just have this operator separated from my normal workflow. And we have this export, and here's a special node we call Alembic export, and that gives you all the access and uh, power to control your Alembic export. Let me now describe what we can control here in the Alembic export. Let me just bring up a little bit more of this interface. The first thing we need to decide is we want to export the particles. Do we want to export all particles, the subgroups, individual particles, and so on. So we now have to make a decision. What do we want to export? And uh, the first step is I don't even know where I put the particles. So it's a good idea to check where do we put our particles. So the position born is uh, going into the all group. That's the default group. Usually um, when you create complex effect system, you will have multiple particles as I showed here. So we can put the uh, particles in the particles group, smoke or debris. Um, I just say, uh, let's put it in the smoke. So now all the particles will end up in the smoke group. This will not change anything in our viewport, but internally all the particles land now in the smoke group. So when I'm going to export, I just want to export the smoke particles. And now we have multiple uh, options how we want to export, but I will explain that in a second. The next thing we do is we just choose a file name, I just name it teapots. And here we have the time range we want to export. We can export the whole time range or just parts of it. And we have various options what we want to export. In 3 Studio Max you can have um, different uh, update methods. So meshes could be for rendering or for the viewport. So if you have, for example, a uh, mesh smooth or turbo smooth uh, operator, that can have different settings and you can decide which one you want to export into the Alembic file. Then we have various export modes. So we can export object per group. This is what I'm going to choose now. But we also have an uh, export option that exports an object per particle. So each individual particle becomes an Alembic object. That might be uh, useful uh, depending on the effects you want to do later uh, with the Alembic file. And we can also export a particle system, which is right now a pretty unique feature uh, for us. Um, so, but I will go with object per group. The next thing we have, do I want to create a single file or do I want to create a file per group? So I can do multiple exports, I can add multiple groups and it will create automatically multiple Alembic files. That's also a time saver because it just saves you for exporting each individual group over and over. It does it in one group. Then we have the normal Alembic stuff uh, here. We can uh, choose the HDF5 file format or the Ogawa file format, which is sometimes a little bit more compressed. And then we can select which channels we want to export. Each of these channels uh, needs some extra uh, memory, some extra space. So uh, we can decide on that and we will check out later how this goes and how we can influence that. So if we have decided on our group, we have decided on the export name, we just press the export button. The timeline goes through and that was our export. Now I'm heading over to uh, Maya. 
and in Maya you have multiple ways or options to import um, Alembic files. We found that the best Alembic import that will give you the most flexibility with your pipeline is using the Exocortex Alembic and our Alembic exporter uses more the uh, definitions that are in the Exocortex uh, Alembic importer, the Create importer. It's a free uh, app or a free plugin so you can install it, you get the source code even so you know what's going on and what's happening and you can adjust it directly to your pipeline, to your Maya pipeline. Um, so what I'm going to do is we have several options here. I don't care about these options right now. We just choose the import. I'll choose the teapots import. And we end up here in Maya with our animation. I'm going to the frame slider. And you see we end up with the exact same animation here. And now the Maya use has the 3D Studio Max teapot as well. So this answers also one question we got uh, in the beginning of this uh, presentation is do we export meshes and shapes? Yes, we do, as you can see here. So that would be a, a standard Alembic cache file where you have full access to the uh, geometry. And as you can, can see here, we can have these particles exactly like we have in the Max. So that's one way to create an export into Maya, but there's also uh, several other options. Um, this was with our geometric instancing. Now I'm going to export our fluid system. Um, thinking particles comes 6.3 comes with a really a lot of enhancements in the fluid system, and I will talk about this uh, in a minute as well. But what we have here now is, as you can see, we have a color change, and as the temperature in our fluid in our smoke simulation uh, goes down, it turns into smoke, and then it fades out and disappears. <coughs> so we are now going to export this animation to Maya as well. Let me just reset Maya over here. And uh, Actually, it's the same deal we do here. Let me just bring over the Thinking Particles user interface. And we have a setup similar to one I showed you. We have one smoke particle group. Um, the interesting part is, and uh, for now I will just talk about it, but that's a very important part is um, in Thinking Particles, we have the concept of data channels. So you can attach any data you want or any of these possible data we have here to your particles and you can store in these data whatever you want. You can create it um, per particle, it's fully procedural so you can store your body temperature if you want. We don't do that in the example here, we store the smoke temperature so it's not my body temperature we see here but if you want it you could store whatever value you want. This data channel survives the Alembic file. So we store this as an extra attribute. So if you're a Maya pipeline and if you're a Maya scripting bodies, uh, no Alembic, they can access uh, this data and they can work with it. And you can decide whatever pipeline you want. You can get extra UV, you can, ex can get extra velocities. Whatever you want to get over, you can just add to the particle and it will transfer to the Alembic file. So in here we have the same deal, we have a create uh, dynamic set where we just create our uh, particles here, we create uh, 20,000 particles here at, at, in the beginning, uh, then we have our smokes uh, group set up, then we have our simulation set up, and we have the Alembic export. The same deal here, we have the Alembic particle export, and right now, as you can see here, we have just the data channel export uh, as um, a channel. I will switch on all the channels just to show you 
that every one of this gives you a penalty on the file size, so you can actually decide how big your alembic files uh, are going to be. So let me just export that, including everything. Same deal here, we're doing the fluid simulation right now and export the particles. That is done. Let me move away with this particle and we're going now to import this. And what I did here um, was, let me just move a little bit back out here, is I exported a particle system, so I was a little bit fast here with the settings. I chose the option to export the particles. So we are now actually able to export points over to Maya. The exact movement, velocity, whatever you want, whatever setting we have here, we can transfer now over to Maya. And inside of Maya, you can do whatever you want, whatever you want to inside to these particles. So that's a very simple, powerful method to transfer uh, thinking particles set up over to Maya. And again, as I explained before, you can do that per, uh, per particle group and with all the procedural features you have in uh, thinking particles. So it's that easy to get the information over. Next, let me show in 3D Studio Max the uh, file we have, sorry, in File Explorer, the file we have created. I will go and just bring up the properties of the particle file. Let me just bring that up. Right now, you can see we created a file. Our Alembic file is 53.9 megabytes, so let's say 54 megabytes. We have included all the uh, uh, channels here. Let's see how the file size looks like when we um, reduce uh, the information here. So I'm going to switch off um, all the settings. And for now, I just want to have the temperature in our fluid simulation, in our smoke simulation, to survive. So I just keep the data channel for the temperature. So every particle has its own temperature file now. And again, if you're in, in Maya and know what you're doing in Maya, you can access this data and assign it to a shader, assign it to another object, do whatever you want. So I'm just going to export it again. It will do the simulation again, as you can see here. And we did the export. I'll bring up the properties again. And now you see we are at 24 megabytes. So it's half the size right now. And if we would import that, it's still working. So we can, oh, sorry. Here it starts to my allergy to Maya. Um, here we go. Let me just. Oh. Okay, this shortcut here, and we have still the same thing, but half the, the file size. So it's up to you, and you decide which of these channels you want to export to Alembic and transfer over to mine. Now, there's also, let me just uh, new the scene here as well. Now. There's also an option uh, we have in Thinking Particles itself. We can import Alembic files as well. Right now, I was just talking about exporting Alembic files. We can also import Alembic files. And let me just show you how we can import Alembic files. What I'm going to do now is I intentionally turn off data channels. So I turned off the data channels. Now I'm going to export the Alembic file. And now you would ask, hey, is this guy crazy? Nothing is checked and he presses the export button. Yes, I do that. And I do this to show you how this works. So what we get now is a file that's even a little bit smaller. 
And if I'm going to import um, this file again, let me just bring that up. So now I'm importing this file. Let me show you that I'm not tricking you. We have this import file node. And in the import file node, we just select the file type, and it's the Alembic file type. And you get the, all the same settings you, you already know from our import file. It's a, a node that imports uh, other files as well. Um, so when we import this file and play it back, you will see we get our animation. Even I didn't check anything. I didn't check velocity. I didn't check particle age. I didn't check anything. And we still get our particles in here playing back. What we do not get is the particle color, so our temperature is missing. So we can't change the color right now because we don't have the color information in the particles. We did not store that. But all the other information we got is, let me just bring back my original file where we did the export. That's my export file. Here, I unchecked everything including the data channels. What we always export is obviously the position. So without a position, we can't export anything. So the position is always there, and we can, when we import in Thinking Particles the stuff back in, we can interpolate the velocities and all the other information. So we are able to interpolate that. Just keep that in mind. Um, the next thing is, I'll now just export the data channels. And as I said before, the data channel is a concept in thinking particles that allows you to attach any value to any particle at any time. It's fully procedural. You decide. And what we have here is we just store the temperature of our fluid simulation. So our fluid simulation, our smoke simulation works with three levels. You have fire, uh, the combustion wall, and the smoke temperature. And for each temperature, you get the correct uh, colors of fading. So we store that. And in my export, I keep this now checked. And I'll do the export again. See the simulation is going through. We do the fluid simulation. And now I'll just load my test import scene where I just have the import node already in there. And now, when I play back, we get colors. So the main thing is we do get this, this bluish thing at the beginning. So why is that? Why didn't we get the real colors? What we did not store, and we could, if we wanted to do the extra effort, we could store the colors as well, but we just stored the temperature. So what we did here is, in our setup, we have in our fluid simulation, we can control the color of our fluid, of our smoke, based on temperature. So the only thing I stored in the particles was the temperature. So how do we get our original colors back? We just have to get our original colors here. So now I can do a guessing game. How do I get all these gradients and stuff? It took me, I don't know, several hours to find the perfect gradient. Doesn't matter, we can load it. I have this set up natural fire, and I just load the, the gradient, and there we go, and we have our temperature back. And now the cool thing is we can scrub the timeline because this is coming from a cache. It's no longer a simulation. We have no simulation going on here. That's just a playback of our import file, and it's a playback of the Alembic file I just created. So that's a cool thing. So you can survive or uh, transfer important information, even procedural information that you create in a simulation, depending on many other variables, you can save that and recover it in your cache file, in your Alembic cache file. <coughs> so just to uh, complete uh, my presentation about exporting to Maya, and then I'm going to close Maya here very soon to gain real, more real estate space here on my screen. Uh, let me just load in 
this scene here, and uh, you will see in this scene we have a fluid, a pretty complex fluid simulation going on where we splash some colored fluid onto the skull here. And I'm playing back this now. This is not cached, this is real time. So what you see here is a real time simulation, real time uh, surfacing and real time coloring in the viewport of 3D Studio Max. So as you can see, we have this fluid here. Now the question is, fluids are special because it uses our isosurface node. So do you think we can export this fluid simulation to Mayan? And I would say yes, we can do that. Let me just bring up properties. And as you can see, here's a, a little bit of more complex setup. So don't be shy, we can uh, create all kinds of special effects here. There's no need that you have to go to any uh, other magic application that might be out there that does some kind of effects. Uh, you can do that in Thinking Particles and you can use 3D Studio Max in your Maya pipeline as your effects tool. There's no need to buy anything from a different company. You can just use your 3D Studio Max license you already have add a TP on it and you will be able to create amazing special effects. So now let me just create another dynamic set just to isolate what we do and call it export. And I'm going to just uh, use our exporter node, the Alembic export node, where we just say, okay, I want to export my fluid because we are not now talking about the surface, I will choose uh, object per group. And again, I just keep, because I'm lazy, everything turned on. And then uh, I will go to my folder where I have everything in here and export the skull fluid, save it. It's now doing the fluid simulation where we won't wait for all of it. It's still pretty fast. Okay, so let's just stop it here. So I exported this and over in uh, Maya, sorry again, my, here I'm going to import it. Oh, where we say skull, and let me just check this out, and you can see that I'm not really perfect here with my Maya skills, but you see here we go. We can export even our surfacing fluid into Maya, and then you can add all the Maya tricks you have, assign shaders, assign, uh, attach other objects, everything is under your control now. And uh, that's a great thing. So just to prove my point, we can export everything. Everything you do in uh, Thinking Particles is able to end up in some way in Maya for your pipeline to work. <coughs> Okay, I'm now going to close Maya to gain my space back. Um, and Maya didn't want to close. Why not? Okay, Maya is closed now. It took some time. Let me just increase the size of this. Okay, now let's talk um, about the internal enhancements we did for uh, caching. So just bring up my caching files. We also enhanced the cache system inside of Thinking Particles. And let me just bring up this scene here. 
So now we are talking about thinking particles and how we handle caches inside of thinking particles. And here we go. I'll bring up the setup here. And uh, actually, before we do dive into it, let me just show you what's going on. That's a little bit of a uh, modification, variation of my initial gas explosion I have here. When we zoom into it, we see we're creating along the way geometry. So we create these spheres. We create these trail particles that follow the spheres. And then over time, it all fades out and dies off. So we have multiple levels of effects added to our initial uh, smoke simulation. And let's just have a look. So our setup looks like this. We have this one big root dynamic set where we have a sub-dynamic set where we control the shapes. And inside of that, we control our smoke simulation. So we have uh, various levels of uh, effects in here, dynamic sets in here. And on the main, we have the shapes assignment, position one, and particle age. So what we want to do now is we start from the lowest uh, node or level to cache out our system. And if we wanted to do that, we just right click and we added some interesting features to uh, the standard 3D Studio Mac uh, Thinking Particles caches. We can now decide which channels we want to cache out. The same like in Alambic, you have now the full power with Thinking Particles caches, particle caches as well. So you can decide what you want to cache out. And the only decision we don't let you uh, choose is position because that's the minimum we need. We need the position of the particle. But all the rest you can decide if you want to, if you need that in your dynamic set or not. So right now we just want to have the data channels here to write them out. And again, the data channels means in this case, it's a smoke fluid simulation. We want to cache out the temperatures. So uh, that's what we do, and now the first thing is when we call this cache uh, record cache, it asks you for a file name. It didn't do that in the previous uh, thinking particles, so now it asks you if there's no cache file, it asks you and you can create right away um, the cache files. And another important thing is the TPC file format is new. It's a per frame cache. So what we do now is, when I save this, so it's simulating, and it's now writing out 100 frames, and when we just let me bring in the file browser here, you see we have individual files now. So we cache now our base smoke simulation, and now this little symbol here tells us it's playing back from the file. So there is no more a simulation going on. The only simulation going on is for the other aspects of the uh, um, particle. So the next step is I cached out these particles, so they are no longer simulated, they are coming from the file. The next thing I want to cache out is assigning uh, the shape, spheres, and I'm going to cache out this as well. Same deal here, I'll cache out the save as TPC, and I might have created an error maybe, so we will check when we are caching out uh, files where we want to have the shapes. We need to make sure, okay, I played it safe and selected everything. So shapes is selected, so we can be sure now we get our shapes from the cache. So when we play back, so the particles are now uh, from the cache, and the shapes, the spheres, are also coming from the cache. And now we can go one level higher if we wanted and cache out the master dynamic 
or we cache out the whole dynamic set on that level where we have everything. So the particles coming from this dynamic set end up in this dynamic set and I can now cache out everything here. Let me cache out this as well. That's the reborn and we end up with hundreds of files. And what's happening now is we are no longer simulating, we are getting the particles, the fluid simulation from the cache file, we are caching this and we are getting the, the other stuff from the cache file. So it's like the lineup is now fully cached. And now if we play back, everything comes from uh, files. So everything you see here is no longer simulated. It's coming from a stored uh, file from, your, from the hard drive. So now it would be nice if you have these complex setups and you can create these setups as complex as you want. If you have a hierarchy of effects, you can just go to our newly introduced cache record hierarchy dialog. And the cache record hierarchy dialog takes care of these caches and the hierarchies because some caches are dependent. So these caches we created here are dependent. Right now everything is fine. There's no issue, no problem. However, let's create an issue for example. Let me go into this shape dynamic set. When I go here into the shape dynamic set, let me just uh, adjust something here. I'll adjust the threshold. Because I changed this, this dynamic set is invalidated and you saw that the dynamic set above is invalidated as well. The only thing I didn't invalidate is our lower base level, the smoke, because I didn't touch it. So this is still fine. We have to, if we want to get our caches back working with the new setting, we have to cache this and this. It would be now really tedious if I had to cache this by manually by hand again. So what we do now is I just press the invalid button and it will automatically cache only the invalid caches in a hierarchy. And I think that is amazing because it gives you coffee break again. You don't have to sit there, you just press the button, take your coffee break, break and come back and there you go, you can keep on working. So we're giving you some extra time back with your complex setups and caches. It automatically detects when there's uh, something. And now let's do the worst case, the really worst case and let me adjust something here. 20,001 particle and now you see everything is invalidated because our lowest level that feeds all the particles for the next simulations is invalidated. So now I have to press invalid again and as, as you see you can have your break. It does everything. It automatically knows which caches it needs to update and follow up with. And when all this is done, we end up with a clean cache, everything is uh, perfect again and we can just play back our simulation again from the cached files. And cached files are necessary when you do network rendering, when you want to archive setups and, and all this kind of stuff, so they come in very handy. Um, let me just go back. And you see this is now directly from the cached files, from our files here. Let me show you again. So we have all these individual per frame files. And that's also a huge uh, advantage when you're network rendering because you now have to deal with individual files that are much smaller and not one big 5 or 20 gigabyte file that needs to be accessed by all the machines from the network. So that also helps a lot in network rendering when you use our new caching system. Okay, so that's about uh, the, the caches we have here. Now let's go to some more fun. 
We are now going back. Okay, I did something wrong. It was me, I'm sure. Let me just bring up a new 3C Max version here. Oh, I have to say that I'm working here with a pre-version of uh, 3D Studio, uh, sorry, of uh, Thinking Particles, and we should be up in a second. <clears throat> While we wait, uh, Edwin, do you have any plans of having TP for Maya? This is one of the questions, and I, it's a quick one, so I saw you may enjoy answering right well, now. Do we have plans? Yes. Good. We do. Great. Yes, we do. Uh, do we know when this will ever happen? I have no idea right now. Um, Maya is really a, a tough one for us to, to handle. So um, we need to get the resources, we need to get the funding right, but yes, we definitely want to do uh, a version for Maya as soon as we are able to do that. But for now we are in 3D Studio Max uh, alone and um, that's uh, where we are right now, but I showed you you can even uh, work in Maya with the Alembic export and get all the effects over. Uh, <clears throat> so let me just bring in my scene here. And then we are back to what I want to show next. This is our fluid uh, simulation we have here. And uh, let me just bring in the fluid simulation. So in 6.3, we enhance our fluid uh, a lot. So we give you new controls to actually create these uh, strings or stringy-like structures that users wanted. Many of our beta testers couldn't sleep and didn't ask us all the time, I want more stringiness, I want more connection, I want more drops, I want more real drops that stretch when they fall down and all this stuff. So we worked a lot on our uh, fluid uh, system. And what you see here now is the controls we have in the current fluid system, and you also see already a new effect we are working on right now, and that's the coloring effect where you can uh, transfer the color of the fluid or control in a precision way the color of the fluid as well. So you see here a little bit of combination, a little preview. That's the first time I show it to a public here, so you are the first to see that. We are already working on getting the color mixed in this um, new solver. And just to show you um, how this would look like, let me just bring up that. So we have now proper color mixing in fluids that will come in the next uh, subscription drop. And here's another example where we created a different, more heavier looking like fluid, more gooey fluid, where we have the color mixing. So the great thing about our fluid system, it is fast, it is really fast, and it works in conjunction with um, many renderers, including our renderer um, we can use in Active Shade, Mosquito Render, it's a GPU renderer. And let me just bring up the uh, Active Shade renderer here. And as you can see, we get nearly instant feedback. So let me just go back and you see we have instant feedback here. And as I play back, and now keep in mind, we have a fluid simulation, we have ray tracing with absorption, and we have ray tracing with absorption shadows, and this is a path tracer you see here. So you will see here the shadows, they use the absorption, the proper absorption from our fluid, and all this works here in real time. I know that you will have a little bit of a delay because of my connection to the internet is not fast for broadcasting, but you should get the idea that the updates are really fast here and you can adjust your fluids really, really fast in real time and your materials and everything. So that's a great thing. The inter 
action with our mosquito render works like a charm, and it would also work with other uh, renderers if they support the materials. You might need uh, other materials as well. So, but the great thing is, if you have a fast fluid system, you have a fast renderer, you really get amazing things going, and you can adjust all the uh, the uh, things you want in the effects here. So, talking about adjusting these effects, how the uh, sheets uh, dissolve, um, we have several controls for this, and let me just bring up my uh, Thinking Particles interface. Um, I'll just keep this open. Uh, let me just close it anyway because we want to have more space here. So, what we want to do is we want to adjust our fluid system, and we uh, inserted and added some new controls here where we have things like the string viscosity that actually creates the stringy look and um, we can have the string viscosity higher or lower and that would create how stringy our fluid is but also our pressure compress that's a new control this pressure compress allows you to decide how reactive the fluid will look like. So I will just go from 0.5 to 3 and just have a look how the fluid looks like. So what will happen now is the fluid will stay together as one sheet for a much, much longer time. So when we have throw or shoot the fluid against the skull, you will see that it now stays as one closed sheet for a much, much longer time. So you can create these amazing sheets. Let me just bring back my rendering so that we also have a <coughs> rendering update here. Um, that also shows you the absorption shadows here. So the sheet now doesn't uh, dissolve or, or tear up that easy. And I only adjusted one simple setting, and that's really the power of our new fluid solver. You can now sculpt your fluid to the way and methods you want with very simple and fast settings. If I wanted to have more drops and a much more violent fluid, I can easily adjust that back again by just one using this little thing here and increase the density, for example, just a little bit more and also increase the decompress a little bit more. I'm just showing this here to, to show you that with a few uh, simple settings, you have full control over your fluid. And I think that will be the last thing I can show you. I just wanted to talk a little bit more about the fluids, but my time is running out any, uh, already. And as you can see, now it's tearing up much earlier, get smaller details, and we get this nice, long, stretched uh, strings of fluid. And we can uh, even bring this down to a level where we can uh, get droplets. Let me just bring back some of the early tests we had here. And just to show you how many tests we did here. So you can see, let me just pause this. We support motion blur as well. Here we have these huge droplets. So if you like that or if you're dire, dire, director asks, hey, I need huge droplets and I want clumpy fluid like blood or anything like that, you can create these kind of effects. Let me bring up another animation where we adjusted the clumpiness again. And we are getting now a different fluid behavior. And let me bring another one here is what I was talking about before. Here we keep the sheet together. So now we adjusted that the water sheet, or in this case, fluid sheet, stays much longer together and dissolves at a much, much later and creates this nice stringy look. So it is up to you how you want to create your effects. And here we have a nice stringy look thing and it splashes down here and 
bring another example of how the fluid can look like. Here we have a nice closed sheet in the beginning. And to the end we have here these more droplets. So here we have much more smaller droplets. When the fluid impacts, we get this more violent spray and droplets, but still these stringy-like connections here. Okay, I think that's my presentation. I would have loved to talk more about the fluid, but time is over. Uh, back to Barbara. All right. Well, that was quite a show. There's a palpable excitement about all the improvements. So just letting you know. And also, we have a few questions. So if you know, if you have a few minutes, I wanna just uh, start shooting. Um, yes. Can I cash to alembic or only export? Uh, you can use also uh, use the alembic as your TP cache. Yes. But we can also import alembic files. Okay. Will there uh, will be there will there be a GPU support in the future so you can simulate on the GPU and maybe CPU? Uh, we are looking into this. However, this GPU integration is not that simple, especially with 3D Studio Max. If you have to pass the information back and forth from the CPU to the GPU and back to Max. Um, it depends. We, we are looking into it. Maybe we can extend it for the uh, surfacer. Maybe we can extend it for isolated uh, fluid simulations. We are looking into that right now. Okay. Um, by the way, yeah, the export is great. Everybody's excited. And uh, but somebody says, but it, the export is great. But if I have it in 3D Max, the destruction scene, so I'm so many objects and so on, and I export this via Alembic to Maya. Can I then texture and assign shaders to my destruction objects in Maya? Yes, you can do that. Um, I'm not able to, sh to show you this because it involves a pipeline, uh, a Lambic uh, cache pipeline. But if you're uh, Maya uh, scripting people, they will create a script for you that assigns the materials. So whenever you do changes in uh, 3D Studio Max, you don't have to worry about the materials. So if you fix your pipeline based on the Alembic uh, file format, you can automate this and just write out your cache and the Maya guy has everything he wants and needs. That is awesome. Okay, this is a few questions all in one. Is mm -hmm. thinking particle multi-threaded? Multi can we do network sims or submit it all to deadline? Um, Deadline works uh, with 3D Studio Max, so there's no special uh, function or feature on our side. And yes, we are multi-threaded. We use all the cores for uh, doing uh, fluid simulation, for example. Yeah, and that's this something. This says, um, I have a small render farm, and we work with both Max and Maya. Do I need to purchase TP for each and every node for render and sim, or we buy one workstation license and with render farm license, we put render sims on the render blades. Um, for network rendering, you don't need to have any extra license. So uh, when you get one TP, in network mode, it will work without a license. That is fantastic. OK. And last, uh, one more question. Can it work with the, with the new Afterworks fume effects in Thinking Particles? Yes. Yeah. Our beta testers are using that, and it works. OK. OK, one more question. Um, this attendee has a question about the Alembic export. Have you tried to access the data channels in Maya or Houdini? Um, what is that? Sorry, can you repeat that? I will uh, repeat it. I have a question about the Alembic export. Have you tried to access the data channels in Maya or Houdini? And I don't know, Paul, if you want to rephrase your question, we're here. Um, ah, if we can access this in TP, um, yes, we create the data yeah. channels. Um, 
However, we, we just create them as they come in. We don't know what they are because uh, Alembic is a flexible file format, so you can add whatever you want to this. But if you know what these data channels mean, so if you have a naming convention or whatever pipeline you, you decide on, you are able to access them in, in TP. Fantastic. Um, so this is it for questions. And um, I will take back the screen. Uh, sorry, because it's so nice. This image is so uh, nice. But let me um, get back to my own um, slides. You should be able okay. to see them in a second. And I want to thank everybody uh, for attending today. And also I want to remind everyone to visit our page at noveg.com where you can find Thinking Particle 6.3. Here it is. Um, Noveg is the best way to buy design software online. And for information on the latest specials and new releases, join the Noveg Network on Facebook, or Plus, or Twitter, and subscribe to the Noveg blog. And don't forget, the next week's webinar is about introducing Solid Thinking Evolve 2016. To rewatch today's webinar or previous ones, check out our Noveg YouTube and Vimeo channels. Our webinar playlist has webinars for every software taste. And today's webinar will be up there as you know in the next couple of hours, promise. Thanks again, Edwin, for a great presentation. It's always very entertaining to see Thinking Particle in action. And thank yeah, you all, no and have a, have a wonderful day, and goodbye, you all. Goodbye. Bye-bye.